Hello everyone, and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Thank you to all of the sponsors of our patient engagement series, including Signify Health, EY, MITRE, and Publicis Health. We would like to remind everyone that the Q&A feature will be available, so feel free to send in those questions for the panelists throughout the discussion. And with that, I will throw it over to our moderator who joins us from Signify Health, Emma Erickson. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me. Uh, thank you, Emma and Signify Health for putting this webinar together and Vera for bringing the voice of a community-based organization. My name is Heidi Sorobolis and I am the medical director for our Medicare Advantage plans here at Independence Blue Cross, a Blue Cross Blue Shield affiliate located in Southeast Pennsylvania. I hail originally from Minnesota where I trained as an internist and a geriatrician. And for 30 years, I practiced medicine in a variety of settings, which included traditional fee-for-service private practice, university settings, large health systems, the VA, and more recently in an inner city clinic owned by a national health payer um, that offered a complex care program for its MA members. I made the full transition away from practice about six years ago when I joined IBC. And in this role, I serve as the clinical liaison to our government markets team, specifically working on all things clinical for our Medicare Advantage plan. So as you can imagine, I wear a lot of hats. And in essence, I help the plan envision what we can offer members and providers through the lens of a geriatrician. And one of the many initiatives I've been part of has been the partnering with Signify Health to create a network of community-based organizations, which we have named Community Link. Hello, thank you for finding time to join today's webinar. My name is Vera Beach and I am the Executive Director of Community Rebuilders in Kent County, Michigan, where we have a mission to end homelessness and we believe that housing is essential to the health and well-being of our community. We know that homelessness is a solvable problem and we are proving it. Through our Housing First Strength-Based model, we assist over 1,700 members of our community to secure housing and sustain it each year. We are also innovators, and in 2019, we launched our Gather Resources Aligned Community Effort, or GRACE Network, as it is commonly known. Today, this alliance of 20 cross-sector community-based organizations drives outcomes and solves social needs collaboratively. I'm excited to share our experience with you today. Thank you both. I'd like to start our conversation by asking each of you to go a bit deeper into your community networks. Both Community Link and Grace Network were formed in different ways and represent two approaches to establishing community networks. Please share a bit more about what drove you to form your networks, how they're built, who's involved, and why you believe building a community network is, is important as opposed to other approaches that could be taken to SCOH. Vera, could you start us off by telling us a little bit more about Grace Network and um, how it started and what it encompasses today? Absolutely. Our network start was driven by our goal to make family homelessness rare, brief, and non-reoccurring. We had been very successful in accomplishing this outcome for the veteran population in our community and wanted to accomplish the same task for families. And to do so, we knew that we would need to leverage the strength of many new partners and bridge across sectors. Our goal was really to accelerate progress on the many complex issues that families face when struggling with homelessness and really promote that long-term housing stability and improved health and well-being. So systemic change, accelerated success for families and improved community systems that focus on outcomes instead of outputs were really our main driving motivations. Um, we were aware of platforms that were being used like Signify across um, the country uh, to really bring cross-sector partners together. And so we did some vetting of platform solutions and chose Signify because it met our needs around closed loop referral, privacy, data sharing arrangements, and customizable workflows. 
And once we selected our platform, we really set out to identify eight cross-sector entities within our community who wanted to work collaboratively to holistically address the needs of families experiencing homelessness. We um, also leveraged our dollars that were dedicated to ending homelessness to bring in additional foundation support to allow the first aid organizations to join the network without any additional cost to their organization. And the group of eight original uh, organizations really worked to serve as influential allies to support the solution. They were very important um, to making sure that the community understood why we wanted to focus on addressing all social determinants of health collectively and collaboratively, and why we wanted to focus on outcomes. Um, but it was also really important to our network that we were able to um, implement our solution with ease um, so that organizations could simply join onto the network without having um, a lot of barriers placed before them. Today, the network includes 20 organizations representing each social determinant of health domain. And we are adding new organizations each month. Um, our community is collaboratively serving nearly 5,000 contacts on the network. Such a complex challenge and innovative solution. Appreciate that context. Um, Heidi, would you like to tell us a little bit more about Community Link Network and how it got started, what it looks like today, and how it fits into the broader greater Philadelphia area community? Yep, great. Thank you, Emma. I, I would start by saying that payers in general are very late to a social determinants of health, uh, whereas the community-based organizations like Vera's have been dealing with these issues as long as those organizations have existed decades and public health researchers have been doing uh, scientific studies indicating and are aware of the impact of social determinants on our health. Both payers and providers have really not caught up with the knowledge and are really, I think just now in the last you know, maybe five to eight years, just jumping in with attempts at solutions and you can really say that the entire concept of what constitutes good health in our culture changes and it's expanded over the you know the past four to five decades. It's not all uh, unusual for your primary care physician now to ask if you wear a seatbelt. Um, do you have guns in your home? Um, do you suffer from domestic violence? I mean, these were questions I never learned to ask anyone when I was in training in the 80s. But gradually, we've come to realize that the traditional biomedical model of focusing only on diseases and those you know, ways of preventing those specific diseases is really not enough to ensure good health. So understanding social determinants of health is just a big part of that. It's actually a very large part of it. I, you know, I knew as a practicing physician that my patients had issues. They, you know, they couldn't afford a prescription. They lived in a food desert. Uh, they didn't have transportation, but I never had a solution for that. And I often really, as a physician, didn't feel that was my purview. Um, so this is where the payer can really play a role. Um, we originally sort of dipped our toe in the social determinants of health landscape about three years ago with a very small meal benefit and quickly learned that we needed a much more robust social determinants of health strategy. Um, and part of that strategy involved having data and, and that data needed to drive who we targeted and how we targeted them. Now, so we eventually turned to Signify Health, who we had already been working with for several years because they do our comprehensive in-home assessments for our members and decided to create a network of community-based organizations to better target those members who we knew from the in-home assessments or even from our case managers um, had social determinants of, of care gaps in their care and that these were not being attended to. So we launched just a year ago, it's been one full year, and in a nutshell, we created Community Link as this partner between Signify Health and IBC essentially what it does is it connects and it tracks IBC Medicare Advantage members who have a social determinant of health to a community-based organization via the Community Link platform. Um, essentially, you're creating a longitudinal 
social record, almost like an electronic medical record. We currently have 19 active organizations that are on the network. And within the greater Philadelphia area, this is it's a huge need for this collaboration. We have hundreds of community-based organizations and you know, no alignment or coordination between them. And so um, also being one of the poorest big cities in the country, uh, we think we see this as a huge need uh, for our members and the, and the community at large, even members who are not uh, members of IBC. That's great, thank you. Vera, what are the most prevalent social needs you see and how is the Grace Network set, it, set up to address them? Yeah, the most prevalent needs that we are seeing today are housing, food, and mental health assessment and treatment. Providers on the network are addressing these needs using the referral platform on the network and recording the outcome. The data provides input that the providers um, input allow us to report on the number and types of needs and the results of the intervention. And this is really useful in helping us to address the systemic issues. But also, you know, we now have data, for example, on who has a food need and if and how that need gets resolved. But we also have data to help us understand the systemic issues that lead to and cause food insecurity, for example. Um, you know, initially, um, when we first started the network, we were seeing a larger amount of um, referrals and needs around transportation. And that was quickly um, over, you know, taken over by the need for mental health assessment and treatment in the last year. And so that's given our community an opportunity to think about the impact of COVID and um, in a way that we have data that we never would have had had we not had the network. Very helpful. Heidi, you mentioned, um, you know, in-home visits, provider appointments being um, entry points for identifying social care issues. What are you seeing among Medicare Advantage members regarding um, how that data and information is shaping how you evolve your approach to social care coordination and management? Well, to date, our social care coordinators, and, and what I mean by a social care coordinator is those are the uh, the workers that we have who do the outreach to members who've been identified as uh, needing uh, potentially um, benefiting from uh, referrals. And to date, our social care coordinators have documented um, more than 5,000 social determinants of health needs and have made more than 2,700 referrals to community-based organizations on the platform. On average, our Medicare members have at least three social determinant of health needs each and are referred to at least three community-based organizations. And the top five documented social determinant of health needs in IBC's MA membership are needing in-house assistance, prescription expense assistance, food, trans food transportation, and income, excuse me, income support. And we, the top five referral organizations we have are the Philadelphia Corporation for Aging, which does many things, but helps with in-home assistance, plumbing, minor repairs. Uh, second would be our Philadelphia Housing Development Corporation. Again, large organization that does many things, but things like rent and mortgage payments, utility assistance. Um, third most common uh, referral is PASI, which is an acronym that stands for pan Asian um, senior uh, services organization helping um, people from Pacific Islands um, and Asian backgrounds, uh, our Cambodian members or Vietnamese, Chinese, Korean, helping with assistance of any type and meals. Uh, fourth organization is Golden Years Concierge, which does light running of errands and transportation. And a fifth one is called Good Days that does uh, prescription expense assistance. And these are only five. I mean, we have many more than this. And keep in mind that the social care coordinators um, can refer to any community-based organization, including ones that, are, that have not signed up to be part of the platform. So there are hundreds that they can refer to, but these are the top five. Thank you. You both touched on the importance of collaboration with others on the extended care team in, in order to advocate for the care of the whole person. 
plans, providers, community organizations, all have different ways of operating and see care advocacy through different lenses, as you're well aware. I, I'd like to dig into this a bit more and explore how each of you are working with providers in your communities and common practices, platforms, and processes that, they, that, they've, um, that you've identified to be particularly important to facilitating this collaboration. Heidi, how is independence working with providers as part of this care coordination effort with signifying community link organizations in Philadelphia? Well, we're literally just in the early stages of aligning the initiative with providers. Um, our initial goal had been that we develop a way for providers to start referring members to community link um, separate from us, for example, you know, our health coaches and our, and our social workers and uh, nurses that work for IBC can refer. And of course, we have our social care coordinators at Signify Health that are referring in. But other than that, we had hoped and thought that at the beginning of this year, we would start, you know, uh, introducing the network to our providers. But we've actually paused for a couple of reasons. The main reason is that we wanted to see our outcomes first before we tried to sell this to our providers. And those first outcomes don't come out until September, We've got a couple more months. I think another lesser reason we've sort of held off, it's not, not that we don't think it's important, it will absolutely be something that has to happen, but another lesser reason is that the pandemic really hit some of our CBOs very hard Many of them are surviving on shoestring budgets, as it is, even without a pandemic. And then when the pandemic hit, uh, they were particularly hit with staffing shortages. So we wanted to make sure our network as, was as robust as it could be with proven outcomes before looping in the providers. I will say another interesting sort of thing to think about, and it's something that we're hearing a little bit about, some sort of rumors in the community is that we hear in our community that there are some large health systems that are actually thinking of creating their own networks uh, of CBOs. And so I, I think it remains to be seen what the final CBO network landscape is going to look like in five years. Personally, I think it would be fabulous if we had just one big network that everybody can get on to, providers, payers, members, regardless of what your health plan is. I think that would be great for everybody, uh, but that will remain to be seen. Couldn't agree more. How are, uh, Vera, how are you working with providers within your Housing First model? You know, it's been really interesting because housing is a prevalent need that providers across our community and across sectors were really struggling to address. So the network was really a catalyst for others to understand Housing First. Um, and that housing is often the foundation that leads to long-term health and well-being. And without it, life's challenges are much more difficult. So, um, you know, we've seen some, some great things happen because of this network and the partnerships that we forged. So, for example, we had healthcare clinical coordinators in our community who are working out of the hospital systems. And they were investing in coordination of medical equipment and supplies to patients who were living in emergency shelters or sometimes on the streets. We ha they have nurses making deliveries of medication and, and other supplies only to have the person uh, leave the location or lose their medical equipment because they had no home. And so when we house these folks, we know that the healthcare intervention has better results and that there's not only a uh, cost savings to each human that's, that's touched by this system, but there's also financial savings to the healthcare system. So it's, it's really been amazing to, to recognize that there's this work going on, for example, in the hospital system that we as housing providers and community-based organizations didn't really know about or weren't connected to, but now we can help really resolve some of their problems and, and also have the result be that cost savings for the system, but also really reduce the impact of the, the trauma of the situation on the consumers we're serving. So impactful. Uh, Vera, I know that also you have led the charge in setting up a technology infrastructure that is helping you facilitate social care um, service delivery across multiple organizations and capturing that data 
um, on the impact of the services, as you mentioned. Can you share more about your technology and data strategy to both support individual health as well as grow your community network? Sure. Our, our data strategy or journey really started by asking where do we want to go and what data will get us there and what will tell us if we're going in the right direction. So uh, our community had no closed loop referral system um, at all. Any, no one was using a closed loop referral system. We were not sharing data across sectors. And those were really top priorities that we wanted to make sure that were part of our solution. So um, that data sharing across sectors, the closed loop, but also building in processes and procedures for data quality and releases of information was really important. Um, and we wanted real-time data and we wanted data that could be democratized so that people could have it in their hands and use it um, as it was as it was being produced. So um, we were, you know, at the same time as we had those those big issues to consider, we were also thinking about how do we collect, protect, and safely store that data. And so the Signify platform was really important in helping us to quickly launch down this path with our partners. Uh, we didn't have to put all that in place because a lot of it was built into the platform for us. On, um, ongoing, our strategy is really to continue to develop shared language and metrics that we all consider um, and understand collectively. We're also looking at the potential to work with our state health information exchange. And we're paying close attention to the Gravity Project and the work of the National Interoperability Collaboration so that we can really learn about and help promote best practices in everything that we're implementing internally. You both have valuable real world experience from your work as care advocates and setting up collaborative care communities from the ground up. As a group, as a lead into our q and I'd love to get your thoughts on some key challenges and opportunities that are critical to address if we are to accelerate transformation. Um, Heidi, I think one of the biggest challenges is also one of the biggest opportunities, how to measure outcomes, as we've touched a little bit on. Um, I know your team at Independence Place is a high priority on this. Can you share how your team is thinking about outcomes how are you, and how you are using data to inform where you focus your efforts? Yeah, thank you, Emma. Well, let me first start by uh, talking about how we used data to inform us of uh, where we focus our efforts. And initially, and the, the, the initial efforts meaning who are we going to actually target? So initially, we used data from sources like our in-home assessments that Signify does, where they do a very comprehensive social determinants of health assessment. Uh, we got reports from our own case managers on member needs, and then um, uh, a vendor we've been involved with who did, ran an algorithm of our data that looked at public data, indicating zip codes, housing, educational levels, things like this. So once we knew who to target, um, eliminating, for example, those entities that took full risk. So we have some health systems that take full risk. So we took them out of the picture. Um, and then we had to figure out, you know, how do we, what do we, who do we even start with in terms of community-based organizations? And we knew some of the big heavy hitters, Philadelphia Corporation on Aging, Philadelphia Housing, and we, you know, just, start, we literally just started with five of them. Um, then once we knew we were going to target um, Signify Health has a relationship with Carrot Health, who reviews our MA data and provides a social risk score. So this further helped, took that group of initial eligibility and segmented them so that they knew, the social care coordinators knew who to call first, uh, who, was, who appeared to be in the most need. But then, of course, once Community Link started outreaching, then we discovered who, what their actual needs really were, how many needs each member had and what the most common were. We then used them and that information to help identify other community-based organizations um, that focus on solving those needs. It's not like we need one organization for housing, one for transportation, that we just, that we need many of them. Um, in terms of our outcomes that we'll be looking at in September, we're looking at four broad categories. One is utilization. 
uh, seeing whether we see a decrease in emergency room visits, admissions, uh, readmissions. The second is quality. We're going to be looking at a couple of stars, uh, measures like plan all cause readmission, osteoporosis ma management, and breast cancer screening. We're also going to look at that segmentation that I was referring to that Signify does with the carrot health data where there's a development of an individual social risk score for each member, we're wondering, does that social risk score go down by segments after referrals have been made and patients and members have been helped? And also looking to see whether there is a decrease in average healthcare spend by segments. And then the last outcome will be a general review of the adherence to the network participation standards. How, how successful have the CBO has been in being able to keep up with the with the participation, you know, you know, meetings on a monthly basis, um, logging into the into the platform, you know, being able to call and reach out to members in a timely fashion, those kinds of things. Very helpful. Thank you. Um, Vera, how is um, you talked about kind of aligning data across the different stakeholders? How is data helping align providers, plans, and community partners through the Grace Network? Are you sharing? Um, are you using shared metrics and how you view success? And what are some of the challenges you've needed to overcome as you've done that work to align? Yeah, outcome data has been really key to aligning partners. So often in our community, there's still a great focus on outputs versus outcomes. So the outcome data that comes from the network is really driving stakeholder interest. And we have some shared metrics built into the system and are working towards more. I, I think a key challenge is getting everyone aligned um, uh, with the same understanding of what words mean and definitions. So data dictionaries have become very important to our work in our community so that everyone can be speaking the same language and we can document that understanding on the front end. We um, have been able to you know, use our network participation standards to make sure that we're achieving outcomes um, related to responsiveness of providers across the network, making sure that all of the um, community members who have a need that's identified in the network have a response from a provider within three business days, um, and, and just really focused on how many of those organizations are actually resolving those needs when a referral is made to them has been really significant um, in helping organizations to really adjust and change their own internal processes to better serve the community. We've also started looking at ways that we can um, partner around additional populations and meet some of those needs that um, Heidi was speaking to. Um, we are currently working on a project to um, really impact um, persons with who are um, aging and have chronic health conditions combined with homelessness. So we'll be tracking um, outcome measurements related to their utilization of uh, the hospital system and um, other metrics, as well as things like A1C status and changes that happen uh, because of the community-based interventions that are happening. Heidi, I know another challenge is identifying those who could most benefit from getting social care support and successfully engaging them with a care advocate or a service provider. Um, what has worked to get members engaged with social care support? I'd love to hear about how Community Link is working to engage more organizations as you uncover needs and, and gaps in capacity, um, you know, where they're not being adequately addressed. Well, I would say, you know, we're, we're proud actually to say that about 50% of all of our telephone calls to members are answered in the, in, there's a form of engagement with the members, which to me is remarkable that there's 50%. And these are cold calls. We may start sending emails and letters to inform members that they're going to get a call, but we've not done that today. These are cold calls. 50% um, will end up having a conversation with the social care coordinators and about 15% actually will sign a consent to have their information put up on to the platform. Um, I would say what's helped us the most is who the social care coordinators are. They are phenomenally good at motivational speaking. 
That's number one. But number two, I think the fact that we have a fairly small team of care coordinators um, and at least half of them, if not more, are from Philadelphia. They live in Philadelphia. We know that it's important for these folks to be familiar with our area, our population, what it's like to live in Philly. I mean, this goes for all big cities. We all have our own culture in our cities because in some ways this helps the members feel understood or even perhaps similar to the care coordinators. I know at least one of the care coordinators herself has been a recipient of community-based organizations in her life. So you're talking, you know, you're, you have someone who's talking the talk, walking the walk with members. This goes a long way. Having a small team is also quite helpful. And we try to have the same coordinator do outreach and follow up outreach to the same member. And this really helps build a relationship. I would say in terms of how we're working to add community-based organizations, um, there's two folks that really play a big role here. One is the project manager from IBC, Julia Weatherly, a master's of public health. She's just incredible. And Alicia from Signify. And these two, these two women together work to monitor the data, figure out the, where the gaps are. Um, you know, for example, there are some organizations have a very long wait list uh, and, or, they, or they just can't help members with something. Then we try to figure out, okay, who can we help if not them? And then they basically sent out, you know, old fashioned cold emails to folks hoping to get a response. The other thing that I think is really critical is that this isn't just IBC and Signify. This is the CBOs themselves who also participate in this. We ask that our in-network partners who um, organized, you know, to be able to give us a sense of who they would like to see as part of the network. We have a CBO council where a select number of the CBOs meet with IBC and Signify every month to discuss kind of the state of the community link, suggested improvements, um, stories about how things have gone well, where the things can improve, ways we can grow the, the network. This way it feels, and it is, I just feel it is a much more collaborative approach. Um, with not with not just a top down heavy handed we're going to do it this way, um, but uh, we want the local CPOs to have influence onto how we develop the community link uh, platform and the network in general. You know, for example, I know just last week, um, MANA, which is our metropolitan area neighborhood nutrition alliance organization, is a phenomenal organization in Philly that provides food support. Um, had gotten a referral from one of our social care coordinators, contacted a member, and the member said, well, this sounds great. Yeah, I'd love to have the food delivered, but honestly, I just don't know where I'm going to be next week. And they, you know, took them a while to figure out what they were referring to is that this person was not going to have a home in a week. And so that prompted MANA immediately. They realized that this person had signed a consent. They were on the platform and said, we're going to refer you to the housing department. They did that quickly. Housing department was able to rapidly see all of the assessments and all the questionnaires that the member had already completed. So when they reached out to that person, they don't have to go through the same litany of questions all over again. They can just focus on the housing issue. It was a real win-win. I appreciate that context. I think that's really um, valuable the way that you're um, leveraging that care advocate model to, you know, really drive that connectivity with, with individuals. Um, Vera, one challenge for community organizations is achieving sustainability so that you can continue to meet demand for services and to address emerging needs of those who, um, who you serve. How are you measuring impact at the individual and community level and what opportunities do you see as a result of being able to demonstrate those outcomes? really think that outcomes are key to the sustainability of the network, as well as being able to manage the diverse needs of the organizations that are participating. And, and you know, they when I say they're diverse, when you think of, uh, you know, comparing what's happening in the healthcare setting compared to what's happening in a small community-based organization, it's just very, very vastly different. And so we, um, you know, have been focused on 
the single population of families experiencing homelessness and have just gradually started adding additional populations to the network. And that's really where our shared metrics come in, um, making sure that we're tracking uh, the results of our services to each consumer um, in the same way that we're not duplicating services as another um, key you know, advantage of having the network available to all of us. Um, we have a couple of projects that we are working on right now that will allow us to share metrics um, and really understand return on investment to the healthcare system, but also uh, working on a project that will um, really show the outcomes that employers get um, in sustaining and retaining their employees when social needs are met within the community. And we believe that these are you know, real opportunities for our community to think about how do we fix some of that problem of you know, where the resource savings happen, the, wrong, the so-called wrong pocket problem, and how do we um, have it benefit not only the healthcare system when social needs are addressed, but also those community-based organizations who are doing the work to resolve those needs. Thank you. So we have about 15 minutes left or for questions. I see that we've got a couple coming in. If you have um, any of our attendees have additional questions, please put them in the chat and we'll um, try to get to those that we can. Um, this first question here, I think I'll ask um, both to Vera and Heidi. Um, we've touched on this a little bit, but I think um, digging a bit deeper into it will be helpful. What are some of the challenges you face with connecting all of the different stakeholders or entities um, together to provide this more continuous care? Um, Heidi, do you want to start? Well, I would say um, what we what we really have done that's helped probably the made the biggest difference really is that we really listen to the data to help us figure out how to grow the network thoughtfully and of course we're literally just in the first year so there's a lot more learning to be done a lot more data to pay attention to but we we really just don't want to add anybody into the network it's not about quantity of cbo's it's really about the quality um, and um, when we have tried to take a targeted approach to recruiting CBOs by getting input from our CBOs themselves in the CBO council, I think those, that's probably made the biggest difference in making the community network more efficient and effective, getting the input from them and, and looking at the data that we have so far. Another interesting outcome that we'll have yet to see yet is that we actually are running a randomized control trial. We're trying to be quite serious and rigorous about our outcomes. So what we did was when we look at the first pool of people who would be eligible, we pulled out a control group and called them an intent to treat group. Not that these people weren't going to get outreached, but we actually waited to reach out to them for six months. So we'll be able to compare them um, uh, to the initial group that started to give us some kind of sense. So I would say that was probably um, uh, really that's made the biggest difference in making the community network more efficient and effective. Sarah, what, anything to add in terms of the challenges you're facing with connecting all of the different stakeholders together to provide that improved continuous care? Yeah, I think the, the largest challenge that we have faced is really the different data systems that everyone is using and required to, to enter data into. So depending on an organization's funding streams, their data collection techniques and sources and requirements are very different. And it's often, you know, initially an initial response that we get from, from folks is, I already enter so much data. And so it really is about educating around the importance of that closed loop um, that we are able to have that co collaboratively addressing um, the needs and uh, responding in real time across sectors together that really helps drive um, people to step away from thinking about, oh my gosh, this is an added burden or another system that I have to enter into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think, you know, the one other thing I would add in terms of 
uh, maybe more of an opportunity around how to kind of uh, gain that alignment is really thinking about how to define shared success and outcome measures across different um, stakeholders and entities who have maybe historically had very different views around um, what success looks like. But as we link together kind of social and um, healthcare industries and think about, you know, how do we work together? I think having, you know, common um, visions and views around that success, those success measures and, and view of success and how we measure it is really critical. Um, thank you both for that. Um, there was another question around um, determining the social score or um, social risk group. Um, as Heidi, I think a question leading from um, what Heidi was talking about regarding Carrot Health. Carrot Health is a vendor that we within Signify um, use to help us to better understand the members that we um, serve as well as to segment them to um, do more targeted outreach. And, uh, Carrot Health uses consumer data that they collect through um, both clinical and claims data from um, different healthcare organizations as well as public data, um, market data, just a number of um, different data sources. And they have 80 data sources and 400 plus different predictive models. Um, they have data on 25 million in, um, uh, it lives uh, um, and about 5,000 different variables. So all of that data um, they use to help to kind of um, define and predict the, the social risk scores as well as top social needs, which also helps um, us to do better targeted outreach um, and social care coordination for um, the individuals that we serve. Um, another question. Um, thoughts on um, potential opportunities to partner with um, pharma or other uh, more maybe ancillary healthcare organizations. Um, Heidi, any thoughts on that? Well, I definitely think there's opportunity. Uh, clearly for pharma <laughs> to understand, uh, you know, patients who need pharmaceutical assistance, absolutely. And um, healthcare you know, healthcare systems in general. Um, I think the opportunity is huge. Um, you know, Vera's description of home health agencies trying to deliver DME and having a sense of this, you can just see this as broadening people's understanding of where people's needs are. Um, so I think the opportunity is huge. Um, I think from the payer's perspective, we take things slowly. <laughs> we want to be sure we have all of our ducks in a row. We want to make sure that there are some semblance of outcomes before we jump in, you know, a whole hog, so to speak. But I think that I, I think it's going to happen. Uh, and I'll be excited. I'm, I'm actually incredibly excited to see how we can get providers to pull this in. As I mentioned earlier on, I think providers, uh, you know, they, even if they started to expand in their practice, an SDOH assessment tool, for example, they would be hard pressed to know what to do if they got answers. They're like, well, okay, so you've got these problems. I don't know what to do. And if you're in a very, if you're an independent practice, which is about a third of our members do not belong to a fully at risk, you know, value-based entity, Another third belong to a large health system, but we a large number of our members belong to an independent practice. And those practices don't have access to a social worker. <laughs> so doctors are, providers in general, are loath to even ask about social determinants of health until they have a solution. So I think once they start seeing this as a, as a potential, uh, you know, I, I think it can be phenomenal. Very exciting. Totally, absolutely. Um, Vera, what what are the decisions your team or the organiz, uh, organizations that you work with within your network have made that you believe have made the biggest difference in um, making your community networks more efficient and effective? Yeah, you know, I think one of the 
the greatest things about our network and, and our decision-making process is that it's very consensus and collaborative. And we're also very patient with each other. So we've we've all came into this saying, you know, we have the shared goal of first uh, making, you know, affordable housing a shared platform, but improving community health and well-being. And so how do we do that together and how do we respect each other's uh, time frame for doing that. You know, on our end, it can be really frustrating um, as community-based organizations thinking like, how do we get healthcare to invest more in this and do more with it? Um, on the on the healthcare side, it can be frustrating to to understand um, that you know we're often speaking different language, and and many providers in our community who are community-based service organizations still don't even know what social determinants of health are. And so, having the network is really um, helpful in bridging that gap. And um, I, I think those are some of the key things is just that patience that you need to build cross-sector collaborations is really important, but taking the time to build consensus. Absolutely. Heidi, what um, strategies have you seen successful in um, engaging providers? Oh, I think number one, you have to have a solution, <laughs> actually. Yeah, I mean, I think having the network, being able to explain that there is help out there for them. Um, I, I think that's actually number one. Uh, I think then it's, it's education, it's talking, it's um, describing stories in which they can see success. Because all physicians are, you know, uh, no matter how jaded they become are still get really thrilled by good outcomes for patients, and patients doing well, and uh, they love feel good stories. So I, I think it is education. It's explaining what social determinants of health are. It's talking about um, how much they p p play in terms of the impact on people's health. Um, I think giving a historical perspective too, I think helping physicians recall, well, because sometimes you'll have the response from a provider that, well, I wasn't trained in this, so why is this my job to do this now? Why would I do this? And you know, I would say to them, well, yes, I mean, when I was trained, I also, I mean, even as uh, my early training, I remember the first time I'm ever hearing about someone being interested in falls in the elderly. And I, the, many of my, and this is when I was a resident, and many of my residents said, well, who would care about falls in the elderly? I mean, that's what they do. Elderly people fall. I mean, this is, this was the attitude that why would you pay attention to certain things? So I think it's trying to give a historical perspective. Now everybody thinks about falls. Falls are a problem and we've got solutions for those. So I think trying to remind providers that it wasn't that many years ago that you didn't think about X, Y, and Z as being part of people's health. Now we realize that those are part of our health and that as a result of that, it's a valid, very valid thing for you to be asking about and we've got solutions for you. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think of, you know, social determinants of health really kind of falling um, in the shoes of behavioral health not too many years ago, which was considered to be, you know, such a separate thing and not um, connected to physical health. And I think more and more rounding out that whole person view, which is exciting to see. Um, I think we have time maybe for um, one or two more questions. Um, Vera, um, how are you dealing with legal, regulatory, and tech interoperability barriers and in sharing data across community organizations? Well, we are relying uh, very heavily on Signify, <laughs> so that's that's uh, really helpful to us. But other than really just staying as attached as we can to some of the national efforts, uh, like I mentioned, the Gravity Project and the, the National Interoperability Coalition, those are really key uh, ways for us to learn what we need to be aware of. And then also looking at the health information exchanges. Um, it, it's really important. You know, at the same time as we're, we're trying to learn 
um, what is best practice for us to be implementing. We're also listening to consumers and making sure that we understand uh, what they want from uh, this network and how they want their information protected and who they want it shared with. So it's it's you know definitely out of my wheelhouse of expertise, and we are relying on a lot of experts around our community, and we have a great person on staff who who uh, participates in the National Human Services Data Consortium, and so um, you know it, it is just constantly needing to stay on top of things and rely on the experts to to make sure that as we take each step, we are uh, you know moving in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you both for um, all of that um, information and context and, and really sharing all of the best practices. Um, I, um, any last thoughts about um, you know, the future of um, social services and social care um, kind of now coming out of um, this last year of a pandemic and um, all of the challenges there? Any um, last thoughts around our future. Um, Heidi, would you like to start? Well, I would say I'm hopeful. That would be one of the biggest things I could say. I, I am hopeful um, and I am particularly pleased that um, payers and eventually providers, I strongly believe, will really take to heart the significance of social determinants of health. And I'm particularly hopeful that the data and the that will indicate and the outcomes will show that there will be some improvement in people's health. I, I am I'm not willing to jump out on a limb and say, oh yeah, there's going to be big outcomes and everyone's going to be healthier. I, I'm a bit skeptical about having a tremendous result. I am confident. I think there will be um, a result that in my mind, for example, to me, it's just worth it if we have members who've been engaged and someone's been helping them. If in addition, we get a decrease in total cost of care, you know, that would be great. I mean, everyone would like that. Everyone would benefit from that. But really, for me, the most important thing is that there's going to be an imp improvement in patient satisfaction and that people are helped. Um, I am not sure yet what I could say about outcomes, uh, how tremendous they will be. I mean, we know, for example, that lifestyle changes are also something that we know are proven to help our health. And yet a significant number of us don't adhere to lifestyle changes. <laughs> so changing behavior can be challenging. Um, and not to say that a social determinant of the health gap is necessarily a behavior but sometimes it promotes a behavior that may be difficult to change. And so it'll, it'll remain to be seen. And then I think it's gonna be interesting. Absolutely. Vera, any last thoughts thinking about the future of social determinants of health? You know, I think what's most exciting for me is the impact that we um, have the ability to have on health equity. Um, you know, we are about creating opportunities for the people that we serve. And when we come together collaboratively, we have a much better opportunity to address poverty, discrimination, and, and other consequences of, of racism in, in our community. So I am super excited about the shared uh, opportunities that we can create collectively on a network and the impact that it'll have on health equity for our communities. Absolutely. Well, that's all the time we have today. I'd like to thank both Heidi and Vera for sharing their insights with us today. I'm personally very excited about the future of social determinants, about the body of knowledge and experience that um, you know, we've built as a collective um, uh, to accelerate the transformation we need and to see care advocacy take hold in communities across the country. So thank you all for joining us. I will now turn the webinar over to Health.